thank you for coming in and many of you in person uh, today. So uh, we are running this uh, uh, virtual echo round. Currently, there are about uh, 27 different individuals or groups that are actually online, so more will come. And today we have a special treat. We have a, a special uh, visitor from Vancouver General Hospital. It's a good friend and colleague all the way. And uh, especially we don't have very good weather for her. <laughs> Sorry, we're working on it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> So it makes you feel right at home. It's like Vancouver. <laughs> and so uh, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Pavlathi Nair. Uh, she did her uh, MD and cardiology training at Queen's University in an ECHO fellowship at UHN uh, in the University of Toronto. Um, and also she completed a certificate in health professional education at the University of Illinois in Chicago. So she started uh, her career at uh, UBC in 2006, and she has served in various education leadership roles, including program director for the UBC Cardiology Training Program for 10 years. She has also been on the executive and examination board of the Royal College exam, as well as the Royal College Cardiology Subspecialty Committee for over 10 years. She is currently the UBC Pro, uh, Postgraduate Lead for Competency-Based Medical Education and the Accreditation Lead for the UBC Undergraduate Medical Program. She is also the liaison between postgraduate medicine and faculty development at UBC, creating a strategy for EDI for UBC postgraduate and other strategies to support clinical teaching faculty. Well, her major research interests, and we've been actually following her, her work over the last many years uh, in medical, her special interest is in medical education. She published uh, many different papers uh, uh, in different areas, both in the curriculum development and assessment in echocardiography. Most importantly, recently, uh, she's the co-chair and primary author of the 2023 CCS CSE Physician Training Standards in ECHO and holds a CSE grant and uh, many other committees to try to further this effort. I think uh, one of the main things uh, uh, is that the uh, levels of training has been with us for many years. And I think, you know, this is the time that uh, uh, as a group, uh, we are updating this and this will affect many of the uh, future trainees where they are and in particular in Ontario, where uh, the training levels are tied in to their uh, reimbursement. So this is particularly important to look at uh, how this affects our training and uh, how we go and get ourselves prepared. So without further ado, let's pass on to Dr. Nair. Thank, thank you so you. much. Uh, thank you so much for have, uh, giving me the opportunity to come back to Toronto where I did my training and have many good friends and colleagues and good memories from my time here in Toronto. Um, so I'm going to talk today about achieving competency in echocardiography. And, uh, and central to this, of course, are the new guidelines that we uh, published last year on training standards. I'll just walk you through why we did these standards at this time, uh, some highlights from the standards themselves and some future directions. So a little bit of patience as we walk through some of these things. So the competence of an echo physician uh, is multifold. So first there's the knowledge that you have to know about echocardiography, how to apply that knowledge in different settings, what to do when faced with unknowns, and you'll all recognize the snowstorm echo image, um, what to do in urgent situations, and then how to communicate the results of our echocardiograms to our uh, colleagues, to referring physicians, to trainees, etc. And in order for us to assess uh, these competencies and this complex construct of competencies, we have to have multiple assessment tools because of the comprehensiveness of that task and uh, the multidimensional construct or competencies we have to assess. So for years and years and years, as far as I can remember, the assessment methods of echo competency have been basically um, divided these four or five common ones. One is experience. So we expect that when residents or trainees of any kind and practicing physicians, when they come to the lab, that by just being with us and seeing and doing for a certain amount of time, that they'll eventually learn the skills that they need to learn. And We've divided skill sets into uh, level ones, twos, and threes, and the 2010 guidelines goes through what this, what these levels mean. And level two was supposed to confer um, 
independent reader skills to the uh, cardiology training. And from there, they can go and read ECHO. And we had a line in the guidelines that said, and I say we because I was I was on the panel then, we had a line that said that um, a Royal College Fellowship in Cardiology, uh, a graduate was expected to achieve level two and be independent reader of ECHO by the end of their training. And trainees would use, some trainees would use logbooks to, to verify the training number of echoes read and scanned during echo blocks and some training programs wouldn't. Eiders or in-training evaluative reports is another form of assessing competence in echo during cardiology training and fellowship training. And now with CBD or competency by design, we use EPA echoes. There's um, two of them in uh, foundations and there's one in core. We have site-specific tests that some labs use to test knowledge in ECHO and, of course, the World College exams. When we look at the, when we do take a bit of a deep dive into these assessment methods, what we see is that they're a bit flawed. All of them are flawed or capture one part of competency, but not the other. <clears throat> so IDERS are based on expert or consensus judgment of a trainee's expertise in scanning and interpretation. And they, it's not just in cardiology, it's not just in ACO. Right across medical education in various um, specialties, there has been a lot of evidence to show that IDERS are very flawed. They have limited reliability and validity um, because a lot of times there's limited direct observation of a trainee's skills before an IDER is, is uh, signed off. There's no greater training so Chi Ming Chao could have a different version of, of what a five is versus uh, Dr. Uh, Howard. Um, there's halo and ceiling effects, which is that if you really like a trainee, you tend to rate them highly um, without actually looking objectively at their skill set. And this is all contributed to what is well known as a failure to fail culture within medicine. Um, with that, we are hoping that EPAs would solve that problem, but we've only had very short amount of experience with EPAs, and uh, we'll have to see how, how that pans out. Site-specific tests, about 15% of programs across Canada use MCQs or short answer tests within the ECHO lab to test ECHO knowledge. The problem with this is that it's not benchmarked across Canada or across trainees to see whether a trainee is progressing or not progressing, have they achieved skills or not. Um, and then the Royal College exams and being an examiner, um, I know and having gone through the exam myself, like uh, many of you, um, echo, the echo clips are three or four and it's embedded within a case with a lot of um, con uh, context. Um, so much so that sometimes the, the trainee knows what the case is going to show before uh, the images are even show. It has very low fidelity to what we actually do in the echo lab. And of course, no scanning skills are tested. So my question is, has this training and assessment paradigm, which we've used for the past two decades, been successful in producing competent echocardiographers? And many months ago, when I was a cardiology or echo fellow here at the Toronto General Hospital, we published this. And this was the first ever study to objectively assess trainee scanning and interpretive skills in echo. 22 cardiology residents at the University of Toronto were um, tested. They self-reported the number of scans and interpretations, which has actually been the standard of training for, for 30 years, is you self-report your scans and interpretations. They did an objective test in scanning where they had to scan a normal echo and an abnormal patient, but they weren't told which was which. And then the scans were, um, were rated. And then we did an interpretation OSCE of 10 cases, including one normal case. Each case was a maximum of 10 clips and we set the passing score at 60%. That's because that's what the Royal College passing score is. And all results were then correlated to their IDERS. Overall, less than 50% of residents attained a pass rate of 60%. And the level two residents who were considered to be independent readers and ready to go out and practice ECHO had an average uh, passing rate, a passing score of uh, 59%. But there was a wide range in that group. So the third year residents, some got 16% on the test and some got 85%. But all of them had passed their IDERS and all of them were deemed to be level two independent readers on graduation. <laughs> What's, um, I highlighted this, the, the cases where they had the most difficulty. One was the normal study because they would see abnormalities where there was none. And then but, uh, prosthetic valve dysfunction, which we all know from experience that this is one of the hardest things to assess. And of course, DTGA, which, you know, in retrospect was a bit unfair to put on a, <laughs> on a, on a test. Anyway, um, 
when we tried to see, well, what uh, what allows residents to get an 85% in their third year? What what correlates with that result? We looked at their the number of echocardiograms that they had interpreted in their training. So maybe the ones that read 400 echoes w- would do better than the ones who did 100. And the R score for that was 0.33. A perfect relationship is one. So this was this was almost random. Their number of interpretation number they had interpreted and how they did. Months of training also had a weak relationship, and the strongest, if you can call it a strong relationship, was number of echoes scanned. Um, but even then, you can see it's a bit of a scatter plot in how they did and the numbers they scanned. In 2022, um, there were. The study was repeated, but this time not with scanning, but just with interpretation. And uh, this time uh, we didn't penalize the U of T residents. We went across Canada and all residents, graduating residents across training programs in Canada were tested. 14 cases, which may be encountered in community cardiology, three to nine images each. Again, not high fidelity to what we do in the echo lab, but representing the breadth of important pathology. So um, babular stenosis and insufficiency, LV, RV dysfunction, Holcomb, constrictive pericarditis, ASD, BSD, repaired TET. Um, three level three echocardiographers predetermined what would be considered critical diagnoses to make on the echo and what would be non-critical. And so critical diagnoses would be recognizing severe valvular dysfunction, facetic valve dis- dysfunction, apical thrombus, et cetera. And then non-critical um, findings would be those that support or explain the critical findings. And this time the passing mark was set at 70%. And there's always a little bit of debate around what do you set as the passing mark? But in some of, some of the imaging studies, especially in radiology, where they test confidence, 90% is the passing rate because, because we're a diagnostic imaging modality. And if we get it wrong, there's huge, there could be potential huge impact to patient care. So of the 205 graduating trainees who did this study between, or did this test between 2017 and 2020, you can see that almost all of them had achieved six blocks of training by the time they wrote the test. Some had a little bit less than six blocks with a mean of 4.8 and some more. I'm not sure how some of them got 12 blocks of uh, echo and cardiology training program. (laughs) Possibly electives, yeah. You can see that the mean score on this test was... um, was not a passing score, but it did increase a little bit with the amount of time spent in echo training, in echo blocks. The 70% passing score was achieved by a very low percentage of these trainees, but still increased according to the number of blocks they did. And the, I think what makes everyone stop a little bit is that the percent of residents getting 70% of the critical findings was was not as high as we would have expected or what we would expect or like to see in graduating cardiology trainees who are reading the echoes of my patients, your patients, your loved ones. So why such an underwhelming performance after six months in high volume teaching centers? Because the training labs for cardiology trainees in Canada is limited to high volume uh, training centers. Is it possible that the experience that they're getting is not appropriate or insufficient? And there is some data to suggest that this is the case. So this is a study uh, published in 2022, variable exposure to echo core competencies when applying minimum recommended numbers. So this was a retrospective review of 11,000 reports from consecutive vacuoles interpreted and performed by 25 cardiology fellows at a university tertiary hospital who graduated from 2015 to 2019. They looked, they counted the first 300 echoes interpreted and 150 echoes in, uh, scanned because in the U.S. these are the guidelines for or numbers required, uh, required for um, level two. The ECHO reports then were reviewed for cardiac pathologies related to the core competencies defined in COCATS. And it was shown that all 25 fellows lacked exposure to one or more important cardiac pathologies that they had to see. And the kinds of pathologies that they were missing in their training was cardiac chamber mass or thrombus, prosthetic valve dysfunction, valvular mass or thrombus, pericardial constriction. I mean, a lot of things that you think, well, if you're in a high volume center, of course you've seen it. But if you're counting only the first 150 or the first 300, you can actually miss it. So counting numbers alone is insufficient to ensure adequate experience. And sometimes trainees are not seeing everything that they need to see in order to learn and in order to achieve competence or even mastery. Our current education model allows competence to be variable and variably achieved. 
And we and the reason is that we plunk our trainees into the echo lab like a tea bag in hot water and expect that everyone is uniformly um, competent at the end of it. But if the experience between trainees in the lab is different and everyone learns differently, and we know trainees learn differently, adults, we all learn differently, how is it possible that they can all be uniform in their confidence at the end of a set number of time or studies? It just doesn't make any sense. But the reason is that for years, for decades, we've used this T-steeping model for education across specialties, across um, uh, disciplines. And this all stems from a 1903 lecture by Osler in the natural method of teaching. At that time, this was considered very disruptive thinking because medicine was taught in textbooks and in classrooms. And he said, student exposure to patients and experience over time is sufficient to ensure physician trainees become competent. And since 1903, this is the way we've taught medical trainees. An education based solely on longitudinal clinical experience, I think all of us would know now, is simply, it just doesn't work in 2024. Because the way we practice medicine now is so different, and the way our echo labs function is so different. There's limitations on hands-on experience. There's limited one-on time between educators and trainees. And so we have less understanding of individual trainees' learning and experience. The, the information explo explosion has occurred and there's more to learn. There's actually less time to learn it because of many different pulls on training time, including worker hour and call hour restrictions, which are very reasonable, but they pull away from a trainee's exposure in the echo lab. To learn in this challenging environment, studies have shown that training in this environment must be structured. There must be graded educational requirements so that both the educator and the trainees know what are the milestones to learning. There must be time to practice their skills. There must be objective evaluation with feedback. None of this, yeah, you were pretty good, you showed up, it looked good. Like none of this kind of blanket statements, but actual assessment of skills. There should be accountability. We need to be accountable for the training that we deliver and trainees do need to be accountable for their learning as well. And time for guided reflections or an ability for trainees to look at what they've done and what they've learned and to see where their areas of um, growth are and then to work on that. And this is called mastery learning. An education system that produces consistently competent doctors in our challenging work and learning environment must use structure and we must focus on uh, competence and we have to adapt. So for the past 10 years or so since the last guidelines were published, you know, we could have just sat around a table and just said, well, something magical is going to happen and everything's going to get better on its own. You can see that the profits keep going and everything's just waiting for something to happen. But instead, over in 2021, we, you know, sensing that across the country, this is not a limited experience in ECHO. This is actually a universal experience in medical education. We got together a national group to study competence in ECHO in cardiology training. And this was called the Canadian ECHO Project. And because we all love these in cardiology, we love these um, acronyms, is the echocardiography competency evaluation and optimization. We have participation of an echo lab in every Royal College core cardiology training program in Canada with grant support from the CSC, which is the Canadian Society of Echo, and seen friendly from UBC. And so we published this uh, study last year. It's a novel assessment tool um, for echo interpretation in cardiology trainees. And so we looked at level two independent reader skills of cardiology trainees, and we tested seven expert echocardiographers as well. We asked them to, uh, to interpret eight complete echocardiograms. So I'm not sure how you guys do it here, but we have like about 60 to 95 images per echocardiogram um, still. And no, is 95 too long, too big? Yeah, we have a few. We're over, we're over 100. We're over 100. We're over 100. We're over 100. Oh, my goodness. Too high. So... We asked them to uh, when uh, we asked them to read complete echocardiogram. So we it is more high fidelity to what we do day to day compared to the three to nine images or or um, directed images. And we used very commonly seen things like MVP with MR, Mixoma, Atavi, uh, ASD, bicuspid aortic valve, inferior wall motion abnormality. Nothing wild and wonderful. Um, all measurements and reference values were included, but there was no preliminary report because in some labs in the country, there is no preliminary report for the echocardiographer. The echocardiographer gener generates the report um, 
Um, yes, in Quebec. Participants were required to code structure and function of each cardiac chamber, valves, pericardium, brain vessels, summarize and conclude, and then comment on any inaccurate or suboptimal measurements. Because um, one thing that I think experienced echocardiographers would say is that we, we are looking at the preliminary, but we're actually making these judgments on our own and then testing it according to the preliminary report. And then coding sheets and summary conclusions were marked independently because everyone was anonymized against the gold standard. I show this slide only to say that um, you can see that the third years had already met their num needed numbers by the time they uh, wrote the test, and then we had uh, representation across the country. When we look at the total score, you can see, because this was a validation study, we wanted to validate this test, that there we did show construct validity in that first-year residents didn't do as well as second years, and the third years did better than the second years, and the experts did, did the best. When we look at the time required to complete the test, you can see that somewhere in second year when residents know a lot, but um, but because they know a lot, they're a bit slow. Um, they they took, took the longest time, but actually you can see how much faster experts are at, at making judgments and coming to a final conclusion. What we noticed is that the normal study didn't differentiate between levels almost universally. When provided with 65 images, residents are able to um, um, uh, recognize a normal study with almost equal proficiency as uh, the experts. But where we really saw something interesting was the wall motion abnormality. And interestingly, when you look at the literature, this is actually borne out, which is that wall motion analysis is one of the hardest things that we do. And when we divided the experts into those with less, who were in practice less than five years versus those who were in practice more than five years, we saw a difference between trainees and experts. Um, showing the effect of experience and the continuing learning that happens regarding wall motion well after training is finished. So something to keep in mind when we do, um, when we're testing stress echo, where wall motion is so central to accuracy. Um, this was the first validated test to assess independent interpreter skills in echocardiography and trainees. And so we've done four subsequent iterations of the echo test, and we're just analyzing this, the results right now. We're using this to assess areas of strengths and weaknesses in trainings and trying to gather how do trainees learn? Because obviously counting numbers and looking at duration of training is not enough. There must be another way that skills are, are accumulated across um, training. So finally, we got to the training uh, requirements. So after the, the guidelines were published in 2010, for 13 years, we've accumulated data and we've seen that traditional teaching and learning has not resulted in the uniform confidence that we will want all of our practicing echocardiographers to have. So this is why we embarked at this juncture on revising the training standards. And you can see there were many, many people on, this, on these guidelines and you'll recognize a lot of names there as well. The guidelines reflect our better understanding of trainees' learning and experience in medical education in general, but also specifically in ECHO. And I really am very proud to say that we have a lot of literature within ECHO education itself, which is unusual for such a um, large but small specialty of cardiology. At the same time, we wanted to reflect the changing nature of ECHO as well. You know, as, as you said today itself, you're doing almost 100 or 150 images per study, which is vastly different from 2010 when our, uh, yeah, when our images were, um, or our studies were smaller. We now have um, cardiac devices like TAVI. We do longitudinal strain routinely in the lab, 3D volumes, 3D images, contrast studies, atrial ventricular functional regurgitation. I mean, our understanding of cardiology and echo has just expanded so much that our studies have just become more complicated to interpret. We had a primary panel and secondary panel. There was broad representation on our standards across career stage, geography, and gender. Academic and community centers were represented. We had sonographers, representation from Accreditation Canada, and all the various specialties that employ ECHO in their practice. You can see that in our primary and secondary panel, we had both expertise and experience, and uh, ECHO Lab directors are there, educators, people, representation from accreditation, et cetera. 
So you can imagine getting this group together and coming to a consensus was not a straightforward job. We can barely get two cardiologists to agree on uh, on anything, but we um, but we did come to a consensus, and that's because um, we went back and forth. There was some uh, national discussion on some of the points in the in the standards, and we did come to a consensus because our guiding principle was a, was patient care, and we all agreed that at the end these standards to. Pro- would provide a standard that everyone should aspire to so that echo services in this country are provided by competent physicians, no matter whether they're trainees, fellows, or practicing physicians, because practicing physicians do come back and retrain in echo. So we need to to make sure that everyone comes to the same standard. Where we didn't have data to support uh, a certain recommendation, we relied on consensus and the expertise and experience of everyone around the table, of which as you know, there were many. So the components of training um, are, there are three components I'll talk about uh, today. So the first thing is experience. So we all agreed that experience and providing trainees adequate experience so they have an opportunity to acquire competence and mastery is important. And we provided or we were very explicit in terms of echo lab requirements and training or physician requirements. We were very explicit that these numbers simply represent parameters of training. They're not an end in itself. It's not as if you met the numbers and you're done. But this just says that you've now acquired enough experience for us to see whether or not you've acquired uh, confidence or mastery. Learning. And I do want to take a minute to say how important it is for us as educators to ensure that our trainees are learning. And we can do this by looking at their logbook, looking at what they've read and scanned, looking at the breadth of pathologies that they've seen, giving them formative feedback, and then looking at their progress of learning. This is something that we as um, echocardiographers have to do and as educators and as sonographers who are such an important part of resident training. This is an important role that all of you play in um, learning. And I I think that's so important because obviously, you know, since 1903, um, we've gone far away from that apprenticeship model of medicine. So if we're not taking an active role in teaching, then we're not doing our part in the learning. But at the end of the day, everyone agreed that some sort of assessment of competence is required. We need to get trainees to demonstrate that they've learned the skills that they were supposed to learn. And this this is supposed is ideally done by testing in an objective way, which is free of any conflict of interest. Um, and what is being tested, of course, what test you use is going to vary a little bit depending on what level of competence you're looking for. Is it at a focus level? Is it at a TE level? And depending on what is possible at the center that's doing the teaching. Um, and then finally, documentation. We live in an era, we train and practice in an era where everything needs to be documented because we need to be accountable to the public and the patients and ourselves as well. So we trained, uh, we framed training around roles instead of relying on the levels one, two, and three, because we felt that this is more descriptive and uh, more intuitive to what we're trying to train for. And we did make, uh, we didn't say that only cardiologists can, cardiologists can do echo, but we did say that clinical competence in cardiology and understanding of cardiovascular physiology and, uh, and a deep understanding of how echo and cardiac physiology works is important. Um, the standards clearly define requirements for the teaching lab or the echo teaching lab in terms of personnel, equipment, space, etc. cetera. Um, all the details of all of this is in the supplement. Um, many people ask me, where is all this information written? But what's published in the CJC is the executive summary. At the end of the article, you have to click on the supplemental material to get the full 8,000 word document uh, with all the references and tables. There are different requirements for labs that train only basic operators versus independent interpreters, both in terms of volume and the case mix. So for example, in a lab that trains independent interpreters, 50% of the studies have to be abnormal findings because the training has to have an opportunity to see prosthetic valve dysfunction, et cetera. They can't see 85% normal studies and expect to be competent at the end. For, um, re- uh, for t- labs that train in stress echo, we said 15 to 20% of stress echoes have to be abnormal. And we can talk after this talk about how difficult that is to achieve sometimes. And scanning is emphasized, as is the role of the sonographer in physician training. As you, can, as you know from that original study, there is a 
there is a clear importance of scanning in learning how to interpret it echo. Um, in terms of uh, basic operator, a basic operator is someone who's able to scan and interpret cardiac ultrasound within the context of their clinical practice or within a specific question. Um, they are, but their skill set and their knowledge goes beyond general cardiac focus. So they have a deeper understanding of cardiac physiology and ultrasound compared to someone who just does general cardiac focus. And we know that that skill set is expanding. So that's why there's that dashed, um, that dashed uh, circle. This is someone we think a basic operator would be someone like an electrophysiologist who uses echo in the EP lab or a calf doctor who needs to look at the echo images to determine certain tamponade, et cetera. But an independent interpreter is someone who can independently perform and interpret echo and provide echo services to other referring physicians. And this is a higher level of competence that we would expect. And of course, an advanced specialist is someone whose training allows them to do TEE, stress echo, run an echo lab, provide quality insurance activities, teach others, et cetera. There are multiple tables to show how technical scanning skills are different between basic operators and independent interpreters with interpreters, independent interpreters being able to use contrast, strain, 3D. Uh, independent interpreters have a much deeper understanding of the physics of artifacts, uh, detailed quantitative assessment of valves, etc. They can look at strain analysis, contrast enhanced echo, 3D imaging, etc., whereas a basic operator is not expected to know any. And then, of course, an advanced specialist has a much uh, deeper understanding, plus additive skills and stress and TEE, and they can do QI integration with other imaging modalities. And optional is procedural TE. And the advanced specialist um, uh, skill set uh, closely aligns with the AFC and ECHO. So this is the table that everyone focuses on. But again, I can't, I'm going to actually quickly go through it because it. It isn't about the numbers, but we kept the same idea that an interpreted, independent interpreter can get additive skills in TEE and stress. We left that in place. What is written in italics and light is the previous numbers, and what's uh, bolded and, and uh, bigger is uh, is our current recommended minimum numbers. You'll see that we have now switched. We have taken. We've gone away from blocks of training to days of training. And the reason for that is that in cardiology training and in practice, when people come back to train in ECHO, they, they are not doing four-week blocks anymore. There are many longitudinal experiences that happen, like longitudinal clinic or adult congenital heart disease clinic that residents have to go to while they're on the ECHO rotation. So it didn't make any sense to keep talking about blocks of ECHO when residents are not there for four weeks straight five days a week um, with post-call days, et cetera. Um, you'll see that there's an increase of numbers, and this is to reflect the increased breadth and complexity of uh, the standard echo. We aligned TEE numbers between independent interpreters who do TEE and those uh, that are advanced specialists, so that because we felt that there should be a comparable minimum level of competence to all T for all TE providers to ensure patient safety in all settings where TE is performed. And similarly, you'll see that there's an increase in number of um, for stress echo um, and an alignment again between independent interpreters who read stress echo and advanced specialists. Again, because we felt that the not we felt there was evidence to show that previous echo numbers were based on very limited data, which was flawed, and that it didn't reflect current stress echo practice, for example, exercise, pharmacologic, valvular, and ischemic indications for stress echo, which is what we're doing right now in most stress echo labs. We can get into the numbers a little bit later. We're also very careful to um, say that there must be a case mix and there must be enough pathologic findings in this minimum number to ensure that residents are exposed to everything they need to expose to residents and practicing physicians. And I keep referring to practicing physicians because retraining is a huge part of what we do now, which it wasn't the case before. Um, we we were very clear that retraining should be done in an academic teaching center with appropriate supervision and feedback because they're learning just as trainees are learning. 
it should be done in a concentrated period of time. We said six months instead of, you know, like a year of one day a week. Um, there should be documentation, CME, and there should be an objective test assessment, even for practicing physicians, because it's the same standard, whether you're a practicing physician or you're a trainee. We made some variation for those who are out of training for two years because a lot of residents do two-year fellowships and heart failure, et cetera, and they may do echo during that time or they may not. And so we wanted to make allowance for that. And then maintenance of competence number. Again, the only big change was really that we, we uh, specified that 75% of the cases should contain significant pathology if you're continuing to read echo and provide services for other uh, physicians. We, has, we talked about simulation, which is a very useful tool, but should, should only represent a minority of training numbers and assessment. We talked about case repositories, which should not account for more than 5 to 10% of interpretation requirements. We talked about artificial intelligence and how they're affecting um, uh, training and clinical practice. Um, we talked about ultrasound in other contexts like POCUS, which uh, hopefully there'll be another set of guidelines to address specifically because we we talked about echocardiography, not focus. Um, and then multimodality cardiovascular imaging, which is a, a training paradigm, which is also fairly common in this day and age with the ability to uh, cross train and overlap train. For all roles, every competence that has a potential to have significant clinical, clinical impact on patient care and management must be demonstrated. This is what CBME is all about. Trainees must undergo an objective evaluation in order to demonstrate their competency in the independent performance and interpretation of ECHOs. If you're going to provide ECHO services that affect patient care, we must see that you can, you can do this safely and accurately. And we have resources to support the new guidelines that weren't pres present uh, 10 years ago. Our very own Chi Ming Chao um, has developed the MD logbook so we can keep track of numbers and breadth of pathologies. And it allows attendings to sign off on the experience as well. We have a validated test of independent interpreter skills as, uh, as uh, published last year and coming um, through the CSE grant, we are creating a national database of echocardiograms, which cover the breadth of pathology. This can be used for curriculum, so to teach resident, but also to test uh, trainees and practicing physicians. So we see that this database will be used just for maintenance of confidence as well, because in some smaller centers, they may not see um, a coronary artery fistula rupture, for example, and so this would allow them to see that. So um, thank you so much for your attention. I left lots of room for us to talk a little bit about some of the challenges and your own thoughts, because I always find when I give this talk, which I've done in, at the Montreal Heart and Queens and at BC, it generates a lot of conversations because I think we're, we're very well aware of the challenges that we all have in our labs. It's actually quite a lot more universal. And some of the, the talk uh, at the end is really about just venting and saying how frustrating it is to practice and train and teach in this uh, environment. Um, I don't think there's a finish line or an end line to competency. It's something that's always evolving, especially as you saw for um, wall motion assessment is uh, some of these skills we continue to learn. But I think as long as we're trying and we're having honest conversations about it, that we will continue to tra um, train the future doctors competently so that we can all be well taken care of in our old age as well. <laughs> but thank you so much. So thank you, Dr. Nair. I just want to recall one conversation that I have with Dr. Yu a number of years ago. And he said, well, I've got this really amazing fellow who has just finished training with us at TGH, and she's going to UBC and start her career. She's really good at, uh, you know, doing education stuff in ECHO, like, you know, there's nobody did before. And now, fast forward, now we have seen what Dr. Nair has done over the last number of years. So very, very um, uh, honored to have you here, and actually great to see all your accomplishment. Uh, over the years, and actually your contribution to our field in terms of uh, uh, standardizing training and improving uh, our challenges that uh, started uh, from the Oslo time. <laughs> so maybe I'll start off with one question. So the, the artificial intelligence really coming, and uh, you can't really hide uh, no matter which corner you turn. And uh, in particular, you know, it's been significant development of automated uh, interpretation, automated measurements as well. And so, you know, it's but the way I see it is maybe in five years from now, you can buy a system both on the Echo uh, platform as well as your reading platform 
that will actually do all the measurements for you. You just have to take the picture, do your preliminary studies, and actually do your interpretation. Not unlike what we do now with ECG interpretation. Yeah. So how do you we deal with it as a community? Yeah. As it comes down this way. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right, and that's why we thought we would put put that in there. And and uh, I jokingly tell Annabelle, my co-chair, that we're going to have to do these guidelines again in like five to ten years because we'll have to adapt, right? Because training and our standards have to adapt to the current practice. And that's why I talk a little bit about fidelity, right? So if we can mimic what we're what we do day to day in in training, then we know that our trainees will be ready to fly and you know transition to practice will be excellent. But if we're protecting and nurturing teaching completely separate from what it is that we do in real life, then we're not helping. We're not training anyone. So we have to we have to um, adapt. So I think we will have to adapt how we how we learn. But I would put to you that so we have we use Muse as our system for EZG reading, and about forty percent of the time we're changing the interpretations of the. So as as great as AI is, I do feel that there is a value to human uh, judgment, and uh, and you know time will tell. But but I think there is still you know. Decades later, we still know that scanning is an important skill for echocardiographers. Like, who would have thought that with, you know, putting, sending spaceships in, to the moon and to Pluto and et cetera, that we would still think that scanning and bedside uh, skill set is still so valuable and important. So um, I'm so fascinated by it because I think there must be something to that, the doing that allows people to learn. Um, and that'd be a whole other area of study. But I, I think we need to adapt, absolutely. But there's certain skills I think we'll always have as humans that uh, can't be replaced. Yeah, great talk. Um, when I came here from Australia, they would maybe do the national board exam. Um, if they need to do it. Yeah, you did actually. <laughs> then you have to do it. So um, do you think there's any role for that style? I mean, obviously, I completely agree. We've got to have exactly as you beautifully outlined is there any data that that actually makes things better? Because, you know, there's this always this thing we've got to add on more and add on more, and yet sometimes I'm not convinced that it actually does much. Just your yes. your opinions on that. Yeah, yeah you know, that, thank you so much because we are talking about, so part of the ECHO study is organizing a, uh, a platform and, and creating a test that all trainees across Canada can do it, which is probably – inching towards what an NB, the national board exam is. But the national board exam, as you know, is multiple choice and test knowledge. And it's very different and not very similar to what we do in real life. And what, and I, I agree, like doing a lot of these kind of MCQs and short answers, it doesn't really reflect what we want our trainees to be able to do in real life. And then there's always the, the problem that I see on the Royal College exam too, is it's so stylized and because it's high stakes and everybody wants to get, you know, 90%, et cetera. And it's not realistic to what we do in real life. And so, um, and no one has ever looked at NBE results and accuracy in practice. Right. And that's, so the, so I, I, there's no answer to that question. Does it result? It's just one more hurdle, one more ring of fire that you have to jump through, but I, there has been no correlation to, uh, what happens in practice and accuracy of reports. No one's done that study. So, and no one, not saying that our study or our tests that we institute will have, uh, will have that correlation. But as educators and the people who sign off and say, you can now go out and read and, and, and take care of patients, I think it gives us greater satisfaction to know that someone's got 90% on a random test that we did where they did what we did. I think we, we would feel better signing off on that. Um, I think, uh, yeah. And, and what we, what I see, I, I hate doing tests as well. And I know how much stress it brings up on to trainees, but I think part of what I would see is that we use these tests in a formative way. So trainees test themselves to see if they're getting better and if they're reaching 90% before they actually write it. And then it's also, I think we all feel, uh, when we're trainees, that we want to be the best that we can be, right? And so this allows them to do that. But I think as as educators, you know, when we sign off on that, sometimes we're very hesitant, but we sign off because we don't have any way of saying they're not confident, whereas this gives us an opportunity to say they are. Oh, that was fantastic. Okay. You know, it really, it really um, makes us think about how we how we teach and how we learn. Um, and it's really quite dynamic. Um, I was going to make one comment and then Talk about the talk about the role of scanning and sonographers. So, 
you know, I, I, it, I, I, I sit with the fellows on a regular basis. And one of the things I've always said is that I, I, I probably learned more echo after I finished my training and fellowship than my gender back to 20 years that I learned during my fellowship, which is quite sobering, actually. And so I think, I think we have to promote ongoing education. I think you kind of pointed to this as well. But the training sets you up so that you have those skills to be able to continue learning once you finish your training. Um, you know, the role of stenographers in, our, in, in echo training is important. And I, and I do agree with you. I think we all agree with you. The learning to scan improves your ability to interpret. Yeah. Um, similarly for the stenographers, doing the preliminary interpretation helps them with their scanning as well. So there's a bit of interplay between the two. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think the stenographers should 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 take a lot of credit for training. Yeah. Of, uh, Absolutely. Of, of, right? I think all 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 really good echocardiographers remembers those stenographers who really sat them down and and and, and um, trained them with a C1 or C2. I still remember. Uh, one of the songs at UHN, JJ. Yes, I know. Uh, yeah. I think he was he was an UBGYN from Eastern Europe. Yeah. Anyways, uh, uh, he was yeah. uh, he was one of, he was a fantastic song for them, just one of many. Um, uh, and um, you know, I think uh, this one of people could shout out song to uh, uh, help train. Um, uh, train the rest of yeah. yeah, and that's why when we put this database together, we have sonographers on on there to help us choose studies and to we want to make it open to sonographers as well because, uh, because they need to know as well where our images are and to see the abnormalities and to learn from the final reports, right? So I think um, we want to make this a uh, learning tool for everyone. Yeah, so like my, one, of my, one of my points in all this kind of goes to the, the test is, is that I think when we evaluate trainings in the lab, they get the benefit of working with the stenographers, going through the images, yeah. doing the preliminary reports. So by the time we get to review them, they've had a fair bit of help. In them. Yeah. So I can see why in an exam where they only have images, maybe not even measurements, then they, they struggle a little bit. Yeah. So uh, trying to promote that independent aspect, I think yeah. it, it could be important. Yeah. Um, but I suspect there are a lot of level three upper cardiologists who would have Trouble building a report. <laughs> a preliminary read from a song. So I hate to say that, but it's the body of practice. It yeah. can be true. So, yeah, Echo is a very unique field in which we is a freehand uh, method. So we currently rely human beings to actually with competent skill to actually perform the uh, echo or ultrasound. Uh, this is actually different than you know other modality where you have a fixed space like CT, MRI. So, you know, having good sonographers and people who are actually scanning and, and thinking through what they are doing is very important. Until Elon Musk with Tesla can come with a robot who can do that, but they'll be way down the line. Well, it's true. But by the time we see the attending, sonographers have done the study, prepared for with or without a resident, the fellows have edited it, and we get the edited yeah. version, right? So it's a uh, lot of layers of, uh, of, um, of, of reporting. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I, I'm very uh, heartened when we did our studies that in senior residents, like in third year residents, there are many who are competent. They really are. Um, but it's just sometimes in that group, there's there's ends of the spectrum. Right. And if we're going to say everyone can read Echo, then we need to make sure that everyone is the same level. Right. Like and that, it's that variability that it's a pretty um, high bar, actually. When you yeah. Think it, so. Yeah. So there's one comment online that uh, maybe we can address. So yeah. um, the uh, participants stated that there are people from different uh, subspecialty fields in uh, cardiology and maybe outside cardiology or so reading echo that may not have, you know, the particular, you know, uh, special echo uh, training or extended echo training. So um, I think, you know, one of the comments that we would have is in Ontario, and thanks to doc, uh, Dr. San Filippo's uh, leadership from uh, Queen's University uh, to uh, come up with the accreditation process for us to uh, have in uh, Ontario so that we can actually more or less have the standardization and, and uh, minimum requirement for everyone who reads ECHO. So how do you want to respond to that in terms of across the country? So I think Ontario is probably the only one who have this process, but you know, there are other uh, provinces like uh, British Columbia that you can only do echoes within a particular environment. So, do you want to just comment on yeah. across the country? Yeah. So, uh, provincially, uh, so nationally, 
uh, there are some stark differences in how echo is uh, practiced and remunerated. And uh, so all the way, you know, in some places it's extremely regulated, like in BC, as you mentioned, Chimay, that um, there's a diagnostic accreditation program and echo can only be practiced within hospitals. They can't, you can't have um, a private office lab. It has to be associated with the hospital. So there's control there. Um, Ontario is... Uh, perhaps the most unregulated from that perspective, um, and which is what, which resulted in the need for uh, Accreditation Canada to step in at that time. And I, and I think, you know, I, I didn't want to get into the remuneration part of this today, just because I think it muddies a lot of what we're trying to do here. I think if I can inspire the entire country to come on board with the idea that we all have to um, take this seriously and that it is important for all of us to train and supervise um, to the highest quality, that it benef benefits all of us. That that would be something that if all of us felt that way, maybe we wouldn't have the trouble that we're having right now, which is unregulation, people doing things without a standard being met. Um, because there are people being allowed to do this, right? Like, since there are others who are allowing this to happen. And I think we all should take a, we should, we all play a part in upholding uh, quality. And so we should just all do that. <laughs>